following message is a presentation of Valley Metro Church, a community of believers dedicated to knowing God and making Him known. Today we're continuing in the book of Romans. It's the book that changed the world. And we're at this part in Romans 8. Romans 8 is explosive. I think if, if I had one choice of one chapter of the Bible that I get to keep on a desert island with me, I would have to pick Romans 8. Honestly, there's other great uh, chapters in the Bible, but something about Romans 8 is revolutionary. It covers so many profound things, and that's why we're camped out here for a little while. We're going through, we're taking little bites along the way, and we're getting in on some of the deep things of the kingdom of God. And, and we're in a section right here where last week it was talking about our hope, specifically maintaining our hope while we're waiting. And waiting is, is tough. Waiting is difficult. In fact, I've never met anyone who likes to wait. Have you? Yeah. Likes to wait? Like, I've never seen anyone like say, I just love to go to DMV. It's awesome. <laughs> you know? And don't even go up and get a ticket. I just wait an hour or two and then I go up and get a ticket, you know? <laughs> or, or someone who, who says, yeah, when I'm in the grocery store, I, I look for the longest line. It's awesome. <laughs> Costco, yeah. Nobody loves to wait. Nobody loves to wait. Waiting is painful. Nobody loves to wait. And yet, in the life of the believer, this text is going to be talking about the hope that we have and the things God is for sure doing, yet we're in this waiting process. And there's a lot that happens in this waiting process. A lot of times where it's painful, it's stressful, it's revealing, it's a test, it's a trial, it's a temporary assignment. There's a lot going on in the waiting process. To me, one of the biggest struggles we have is when you know you have this sense of God's calling, you have this sense of what God says he's gonna do, you believe God is according to his word and his spirit, there's, there's something that God is gonna do. You, you really believe it's the will of God in your life and the word lines up with it and so you're walking in faith to that but the timing of God seems a little disconnected with that. Anybody ever been in that situation? Where the calling and the will you sense is clear, but the timing, you're like, what in the world's going on here? That is this kind of waiting. That's the kind of waiting where we're waiting in hope, yet we're waiting, and it can be painful, and it can be long, it can be tedious. I know it's certainly revealing, and that's exactly where Paul's at in this passage, this waiting process. The good news is this. We're not alone. We have help. The Holy Spirit is our helper. And in this passage, we're talking about literally getting help from God. What I found is some folks don't want help. You ever talk to folks and they're like, no, I'm good. Can I help you? Nope, good. You sure? Looks like you're breaking your back. Nope, good. You know, God is saying that to people all the time. Can I help you with that? People are like, nope, I'm good. I got it. Well, let's look at this passage. Eight, uh, Romans 8, uh, 24 is where we're going to pick this up. And if you have a bulletin, if you don't have your Bible, it's in the bulletin. Let's take this in sections and discover what this has to say about getting God's help. It starts in verse 24 and it says, For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Let's stop right there. This again is talking about the waiting process which we know can be very painful. How many of you know that the silence of heaven can be a very trying experience? Waiting. Waiting. That's a trying experience. The Israelites had these same experiences. God shows up, manna from the heaven, and it's all cool, and then after a while, nothing. Where's our water? They're waiting for water from a rock. Silence of heaven. The Israelites dealt with this for 40 years where God would show them, they'd walk in faith, then they'd stop walking in faith. And in their trial of waiting, they would complain and they wouldn't trust in God. And I think we do the same thing. We have this little tension going on on how we wait, the different ways we wait. And I think there's a couple of different ways that we can wait. We can wait in our, in our own strength, doing it our way, or we can wait in the strength of God. And if you like me, you've realized that when we do wait in our own strength, there's something that happens really quickly. We get impatient, right? 
when we're in our own strength waiting, we get impatient pretty quickly. We get a little frustrated. We really want to start making things happen. We get a little tired of waiting. Amen? Is this anybody else or just me? We get a little tired of waiting. We don't understand why we're waiting this long. Might even think God skipped us over on something. And in this process of waiting, we get frustrated. We try to force some change sometimes. Might even take a shortcut. And when we do this, we start getting ahead of God. We start getting ahead of the Holy Spirit and God's process in our life. That's what we do quite often, actually. We're supposed to walk by faith, but we often walk by sight and we don't see change coming and we're waiting. We finally go, something's got to change here, so here goes. Now, I want to be clear when I preface this. There are some things in the Bible that God gives very clear indication of what you and I are supposed to do. There's things we're supposed to do regarding our life, our walk, our family, where you just walk these things out in faith and they're verbs like go. The Bible's got these verbs in the New Testament where we go, where we don't have to just stop and wait and say, oh God, I'm just gonna sit here and not do anything and pray. There are plenty of things in the New Testament that you go when it comes to working and being diligent and, and what we do with our families and how we love and how we forgive. These are verbs that we go. Yet there's other times when it's beyond your control and mind, and there's nothing we can do but wait. In those times, we can try to force things and make them happen, or we can slow down and, uh, and wait. We can do it in our strength or in God's. Now, when we do it in God's strength, he sustains us in the process. That's the beautiful part. He sustains us in the process. If we do it in God's strength, he can give us, as the Bible says, peace that passes understanding. Right In the middle of waiting, he can give us peace. It's beautiful. In fact, peace is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. That if we're walking with God, we can be in the middle of a major trial and it can be a long one and we can actually have peace that passes understanding where your friends think it's crazy. <laughs> How can you have peace? How can you not be flipping out right now? God gives me peace that passes understanding. It's not me. It's what he's doing. You know, that We can do it our way or we can do it his way. The Bible says those who wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord, will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Those who wait on the Lord. But sometimes we don't want to wait. We just got to handle our business. We got to get it done. We're tired of waiting. I already prayed about it. I've already been waiting. Now I'm moving on. Now I'm taking the bull by the horns. Now I'm just going to get some stuff done. I'm not waiting on God anymore. This is what we do, guys. And the thing about the process that I've seen in the Christian walk, that if we're faithful with little things, God will make us faithful of greater things. And sometimes this is a test that we take, keep taking over and over and over and over because we don't know how to wait on the Lord or in his strength. It happens all the time. Uh, God knows that waiting is an area of weakness for us. God knows that. And uh, the Holy Spirit, this passage says, wants to help us in our, in our weakness. Now, when we think of weakness, that's not something we talk a lot about, weakness. I mean, have you ever walked up to someone, hey, how you doing? My name is Brian. Can I tell you about my weaknesses? <laughs> yeah, I got a bunch of them. You got an hour? Nobody does that at a party. What's your name? My name is Bill. Hey, Bill, what's your weaknesses? Well, glad you asked. <laughs> Nobody talks about it. Job, job interview. So tell us your weaknesses. I'm sitting there. Nobody wants to talk about weaknesses. The reality is, we have weaknesses, but we don't talk about our weaknesses. In fact, what we normally do, we ignore our weaknesses. Isn't that what we do? Just try to ignore them. Here's the problem. You can't ignore your weaknesses. The Bible's got a lot to say about our weaknesses, calling it weakness here, and we tend to ignore it and not even own it or not come to terms with it, but God wants to do something profound with our weakness but we don't even acknowledge our weakness. A lot of times we just ignore it. We just go down the road. We just pretend it's not there. Uh, the Bible knows that it's there. Uh, we don't like to talk about it. Our first point this morning, because this is saying that the Spirit of God wants to help us in our weakness. First thing to come to terms with this morning, if you're a note taker on this topic of getting God's help, is to acknowledge our weaknesses. Don't ignore them. Acknowledge them. Now, you don't have to run around and tell everybody at the party or your job interview, hey, can I tell you my weaknesses? But you do have to come to terms with them yourself. Come to terms with your weaknesses. Don't act like they don't, 
exist or they're not there. We all have weaknesses. God knows they're there. He knows them better than we know ourselves. And God's like, beautiful, that's why I'm sending my Holy Spirit because I want to help you in your weaknesses. I think a lot of folks miss out on this because they don't want to come to terms with their weakness. And I think they miss out on the help of God, help of the Holy Spirit. Acknowledge our weaknesses, don't ignore them. You know, Paul was in a situation of waiting like this. He talks in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, where he's waiting on God, he's waiting, he's waiting, and he's in a tough situation. You know what he says in this time of waiting? This is what God spoke to him, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. This is in your bulletin, I believe. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect, not in your strength, not in your talents, in your weakness. Paul's like, what? This is revolutionary. Did I hear what I think you said, God? I've been waiting and praying a long time. Is this the answer? My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Whoa, Paul, are you saying that you're not only coming to terms with your weaknesses, but you're gonna acknowledge them openly And in so doing, God's going to show up and rest on you in greater power? Yes, that's what he's saying. Why? Because in the same way, the Spirit of God wants to help us in our weaknesses. But we don't want to talk about them. We don't want to acknowledge them. We want to ignore them. We want to mask them. We want to medicate them. We want to do all sorts of stuff and just move on. Forget about them. And I think the Scripture says you can't. The Spirit wants to help you and me in our weaknesses. And God knows we have them. Come to terms with them. We've got to acknowledge them. There's something powerful, as Paul says, about the power of God after, after we acknowledge our weakness. Something powerful about that. It's like when we go to, before God and we confess things. It's the power of God that comes after confession. Why? Because we just admit stuff. God's like, beautiful, I can work with that. It's the same with weakness. Well, you just admit it? Say you need my help? God's like, beautiful, I can work with that. And this is stuff God knows that we forget and we kind of compartmentalize and we just kind of move on. Eh, I don't want to do that. But listen, guys, the spirit of God, rule number one, getting the spirit's help, got to acknowledge our weakness. He helps us in our weaknesses. Some are saying, it's cool, I don't have any, I'm fine. When you get this down, you can say like Paul, when I am weak, he is strong. You can say that with confidence when you acknowledge weakness. You can say, I can't, but he can. And you can say that with authority. You can say it because you know it. Because he makes his power perfect in our weakness. There's something huge going on about this. But the passage says the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. In John 14, Jesus says, look, you guys are going to get the Holy Spirit, okay? I'm not going to leave you. I am going to send you. You're going to get a helper from the Father. A helper. The Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to come as your helper, And the context here is to be in help in our weakness. The problem is sometimes we don't want help. We just don't. Sometimes we're quite self-sufficient and we don't really want help. Sometimes we don't let him help. Sometimes we're like, no, it's cool. I got it. And we're doing that with God. God's like, if you would just acknowledge the weakness and ask me in this area, I will show up with power and my power will be made perfect in weakness. No, it's cool. I got it. I'm good. Got a handle on it. And we don't come to terms with these things. It happens all the time. It's like the story of the guy who who lived in that town and it rained and the floods were rising and they finally came by to evacuate with the big bus. And they said, sir, jump in the bus. Come on, the town's flooding. He's like, no, it's cool. I got it. Don't need your help. So pretty soon the floods are rising more and more. He's up at the second story window. They come by in a boat. They say, sir, jump in, please. We're trying to help you. No, I'm good. I got it. And then later on, the flood's getting higher. He's on the roof and they come by with a helicopter dropping a ladder down saying, sir, we got some help for you here. Please grab the ladder. No, it's cool. I got it. The next scene, guy's in heaven. God's like, what were you thinking? I sent you a bus, a boat, and a helicopter. But people are like, it's all right. I'm good. I don't need the help. You see, there's something about power being made perfect in weakness. And I believe it's the same with the Holy Spirit in our life, that he wants to help in ways, but we don't even want to acknowledge it. This is a personal thing. This is something you got to get with God and do some soul searching and you got to come to terms with 
Search me, O God. Know my ways. As David said, David's like, look, David was a warrior. David was a leader. But he was man enough to say, search this stinking heart of mine, God, and I know I got weaknesses. Would you search it? Would you create in me a clean one? Because I got, I got weaknesses in here and I need your help. God's like, I can work with that. And after David said stuff like that, God started to turn things around for him. It's really important to come to terms with that. But sometimes we don't let them. The question this morning is, will you let the Holy Spirit help you? Will you let him help you? He is the helper. Sometimes we don't want him to help us. We're good. I got it. This is the kind of stuff we need to get down. Now the context in this passage here is keeping our hope while we're waiting, right? And it's tough while we're waiting to keep our hope and, and to press in. It's a very vulnerable place to be when we're waiting and we're waiting. How many of you guys have received life lessons in a time of waiting? When you're waiting and waiting and, and only in that time could a life lesson come out of it. Not when you're stampeding ahead and everything's going great. No, when you're waiting and you're praying and you're waiting and you're kind of vulnerable, you're being pressed in, you're in a time of pain, that's when the life lessons come through. And that's an important time. But some people, um, they get a little self-sufficient. There's a, a great snapshot of this of, of King uh, Saul. And it's in um, 1 Samuel 13. But King Saul, he started out well. Started out trusting God. He started out waiting for God. But as time went on, he got more and more self-sufficient. I got this. I can handle this. I got the experience for this. I got the talent for this. I got the resources for this. I'm good. It's cool. I'm good. I got it. And as time went on, he stopped waiting on God. He just handled it himself. And there's a snapshot in here uh, of 1 Samuel 13. And, and what it is is Saul says, listen, God's got an instruction for you. Wait on God. And, and Saul goes, you know what? After a while, it's cool, I got it. I'll just handle it myself. And it's catastrophic consequences for him because he's got this pattern in his life. And Saul tends to do this again and again and again. Not wait on God, just grab the steering wheel and saying, it's fine, I got it, God's late. God's late, God's people's late, everyone's late, whatever, I, I got it. Grab the wheel, I'm gonna handle this thing. It says in 1 Samuel 13, Saul waited seven days according to the times set by Samuel the prophet. But Samuel did not come, so Saul offered the burnt offering. Now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came. And Samuel said, what have you done? That's the prophet speaking through the word of God. What have you done? God's telling you, wait. He told you clearly, wait. He's, he's trying to do something here, but you just start doing stuff that God's not asking you to do and you're getting ahead of, of God. And, and Saul was a leader and he was supposed to follow in, in God's footsteps and not charge ahead of him. But he did this again and again and again as a pattern. And he kept striking out. And God kept giving him chances and he keeps getting ahead of God, keeps getting ahead of God, keeps getting ahead of God. I think we do the same thing. Honestly, I think we, sometimes we start doing instead of interceding. There's a time when you're in a time of waiting and it's out of your hands that we gotta stop the doing and start interceding. There's a time where you gotta wait on the Lord. There's a time you gotta wait. Oswald Chambers reminds us to beware of getting ahead of God because that's what we can do. Instead of keeping in step with the Spirit, we get ahead. Even in well intentions, we charge ahead, we stampede, we think this is gonna fix it, it's gonna make it better. And I would say, like Saul, that our impatience has consequences. His did, I think ours does as well. I think not letting the Holy Spirit help us has consequences. I think we take tests over and over and over again. I don't know about you, there's some tests I don't wanna take over again, amen? There's some tests I'm done with taking. I wanna move on, I wanna graduate in some of these tests. and. Uh, I think when we get impatient and we stop interceding and start doing, I think that's what happens. Like Saul, we look at what is seen instead of what is unseen. And when we think that God is not in our situation, we forget that he is totally proactive behind the scenes. We forget that. We forget the resources of the living God. We're walking in the natural. We're walking in the scene. I don't see it happen. I'm just going to handle it. Somebody's got to handle it instead of waiting on the helper. And I think we do this all the time. Listen, the Holy Spirit wants to help us in our weakness. So we gotta be careful to not do the Holy Spirit's job. 
Nobody can do the Holy Spirit's job. I can't, you can't. Nobody can do the Holy Spirit's job. Only the Holy Spirit can do the Holy Spirit's job. And I think what we do when we try to do the Holy Spirit's job is we mess it up and make it even more difficult. Nothing's too difficult for God, but the Holy Spirit's got to come in and clean up a mess that we made by trying to fix it. We'll handle it. Reminds me of years ago when I was a mechanic, they used to have this, the labor rates posted there. In many service industries, they have the labor rates posted. And it would be like, well, $50 an hour is the labor rate, but if you... Uh, if you want to help, then it's 75 bucks an hour. But if you tried working on it before and made it worse, then it's 100 bucks an hour. You know, there's something about how we try to get in there. And any of you who have a service job, you know that people sometimes mess things up worse than it should have been. And they got their hands in there and made it worse. Um, I think it's that way with the Holy Spirit. When we try to get in there and handle stuff, I think we muddy the water and make it worse. Where we should say, you know, this is an area of weakness. God... Holy Spirit, would you help me in this area of weakness? Holy Spirit would say, yes, <laughs> I would love to. That's why I'm sent, to be the helper. And sometimes we're like, no, it's okay, I got it. I'm good, I got it. Um, this passage goes on. Um, you know, before I say that, John Maxwell said this about, about taking shortcuts, about how sometimes we get ahead of God and we, we kind of are quick to the chase. And he says this about taking shortcuts. He says, one of the most common obstacles to success is the desire to cut corners. But shortcuts never pay off in the long run. If you find that you continually give in to your moods or impulses, then you need to change your approach to doing things. Cutting corners is really a sign of impatience and poor self-discipline. That's what Saul did. His moods, his impulses were saying, I ain't wait, I, seven days is up, as far as I'm concerned. Bam, charging ahead. And we find these moods and these impulses and this, it's really flesh taken over instead of going, Holy Spirit, you're the helper. Would you show up in power here? Can your power be made perfect in weakness right now, God? That's what your word says. Could you do that? Holy Spirit would say, bravo. I've been waiting for you to ask. Just waiting for you to ask. Uh, it moves on in verse 26. And it says, we do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to God's will. We're going to talk more about God's will next week, but this is telling us right now that when we get in these times of waiting, when we're in these trials and we're waiting and we, we're getting a little stressed out and we're, we're waiting, you and I don't really know how to pray, the passage is saying. We don't really know. I mean, we think we do. We see what the natural solutions ought to be. And we start asking for the natural things based on what we see. That's a very natural response to prayer. But we don't really know how and what we ought to pray if we are to be honest because the Spirit of God knows all things. He searches all things. He sees all things. He's not limited to time, space, dimension. He's all-knowing, all-powerful, always present. He sees the response behind every answer that can ever happen on the planet. He's all-knowing. The Holy Spirit comes in. And he's not just the comforter, but in this case here, he's not just the helper. He's the intercessor. Now, we don't think of the Holy Spirit as the intercessor. Comforter, okay. Helper, all right. Intercessor. The Spirit of God, creator of the universe, residing in the hearts of men and women who believe in the resurrected Jesus, also has a profound role of interceding from the inside, something we don't think about. This is revolutionary because this has to do with what goes on while we're waiting, while we're stressed out or flipping out, while we're waiting, while we're in a trial, what God wants to do on the inside. It's talking about him as an intercessor. And intercessor means to stand in the gap, literally go to bat for you. That means the spirit of God on the inside is not gonna leave you as orphans. He's going to bat for you. We don't think of this all the time. And... Um, it says that he intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. That's a really interesting statement. And really what this means is that there's a welling up on the inside that you simply cannot put into human terms, human language. It's beyond your words, your definitions are mine. It's beyond the Webster Dictionary. It's beyond what you can dictate or clarify or communicate. It's beyond that 
There's a welling up on the inside of the Spirit of God Himself when He starts to go to bat for you for things and it's happening from the inside out. It's the Spirit of God doing it. It's not you. It's the Spirit of God doing it. We don't realize, a lot of us, that that's even going on, but this is what this is telling us. It's beyond our natural ability to understand or communicate. That's what the Spirit of God's doing from the inside out. <clears throat> Think about this for a minute. 1 Corinthians 16 tells us, your body is the temple, temple of the Holy Spirit. What happens in temples? Prayer and intercession is made in the temple. Jesus said about the temple, when you asked him about the temple, he said, the temple, it's my house. That temple up there, it's my house. And guess what? It will be a house of prayer. That's my temple up there. It's gonna be a house of prayer. Your body, church, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You can tell somebody next to you right here. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Tell somebody. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit right here. Think about this. It's not your temple. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? It's not like it's my temple. I do what I want with my temple. No, it's not my temple. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. God who died and gave himself for me. It's not my temple. It's not your temple either. It's his temple. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. What happens in temples? Prayer. Intercession is made. Spirit of God living in you. Make an intercession. And we make intercession from this temple too. There's something profound about this. This is telling us a couple of things. If you, a note taker, here's step two and three. The second one is this. We are responsible for the conscious part of prayer. For the things we see, recognize, can discern at all, we are responsible. All things through prayer and supplication make your requests known. Everything you can see, sense, feel, recognize, discern, everything in prayer. James says you have not because you ask not. Well, I didn't know if I should pray for that. I thought, no, anything you sense, feel, everything by prayer and supplication. Prayer, let your requests be made known to God. So everything, we are responsible for the conscious part of our prayer. Here's the good news. The Holy Spirit is responsible for the unconscious part of prayer. And that's beautiful. Because there's so much we don't know what to pray for or how to pray like the text is telling us. This is, this is not God guessing. God is saying, no, you don't really know how to pray and what to pray for. <laughs> that's why I'm giving you the helper. Because he knows all things and searches all things. We're very limited in our scope of understanding and what we get and what we see and how we pray. It's kind of linear and, and one-dimensional. But the Spirit of God is multi-dimensional, not limited to anything. And he sees like x-ray vision through everything. And he prays for, it's his responsibility to pray for the unconscious part. And, you know, maybe this is a good time if the worship team comes up. And I want to share this next step and I want you to please track with me on this because to some of you this may be new but it is um, profoundly important. When we talk about getting God's help, when it comes to getting God's help in this context of our weakness and what he will do, in the context of the Holy Spirit being the helper and the intercessor, what we see right here, he prays for us. We know the Holy Spirit from what this says Praise in us, right? Isn't that what it says? The Holy Spirit prays in us. But listen, Ephesians 6 asks us to pray in Him. You're like, what, what are you saying? This passage is telling us that the Holy Spirit prays inside of us. I think we were clear. We kind of laid that out there. But Ephesians 6 is telling you and me to pray in Him. So you mean to say the Holy Spirit prays inside of us and we are supposed to pray in the Holy Spirit? Exactly. What does that mean? It's a little larger than just today's discussion. But I will say it's enormous. It's profound and there's breakthrough. To let the Holy Spirit pray in you, but for you to pray in the Holy Spirit. It says in Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in, in, in the Spirit. To pray in the Spirit. Paul talks about praying in the Spirit. We talk today about the Spirit praying in us. 
Here's the cool part of intercession, guys. You can partner with the Holy Spirit on ways that are profound if you are willing to. You can partner in levels of intercession with the Spirit of God if you are willing to. Let Him pray in you and you pray in Him. What does that mean? Start the discovery. It's profound, but it goes beyond just your idea. And I got a good suggestion. You asked me to pray for this and I'm going to pray for that need. Beautiful. That's praying with your intellect. Somebody says, look, I'm struggling about a job. or five. That's great. Let's, let's agree with each other. When two or more are gathered in my name, let's pray. Let's agree. Let's ask God. Let's intercede. Beautiful. That's a beautiful prayer. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's more dimensions to intercession than that. Some of the dimensions are the Spirit of God praying for the things you don't know even how or what to ask for. Me either. Another whole dimension is me and you praying in, in the Holy Spirit where the Spirit of God begins to tell you what to pray for, show you how to pray, stuff that you'd never even think about. Why? Because he's the Spirit of God and he's in you. And there can be a deeper relationship of intercession when we partner with the Spirit of God. So the fourth point this morning is the Holy Spirit prays in us and we should also pray in him. That's Ephesians 6 telling us that. There's more scriptures to say that. We're gonna close in prayer this morning, but I've been praying a lot for the church this week. And there's a lot of folks going through all kinds of different stuff. Many of you are in these seasons right here where you're waiting, where you sense calling of God, you sense God's will here, but what in the world's going on with the timing? <laughs> what, what's with the disconnect, it seems? And the bottom line is we really don't know what, the, we're praying, we're asking for stuff, we're asking for natural solutions. They make sense, they're well intended, there's nothing wrong with those. But it's bigger than that. It's wider than that. There's more dimensions to that. Intercession is huge. The Holy Spirit wants to go to bat for you in deeper dimensions. He wants to pray in you and you pray in him. We had a little prayer time with our prayer team and our prayer team's gonna come up this morning. And I wanna encourage you, if there's ever a time that you come up and say, you don't even have to explain. You don't even have to explain the whole story. Let's let the Holy Spirit do that. You don't have to explain, well, this happened, then I lost my job, and then this, and then my aunt got sick, and then, you know how we do? You gotta, like, no, no, in the natural, we need to know the whole story, so we, we need to pray. I get it. That's not knocking that. But there's another dimension about the Spirit of God knowing all things and searching all things that goes beyond, surpasses understanding. And you just say, I need, need prayer. And let's see what the Holy Spirit does. Are you willing to embark on dimensions of praying in the Spirit? Because, guys, it goes beyond <laughs> where we're at. God's pursuing us more. And until we start taking deeper set steps and getting into the water deeper, instead of dabbing our toes in the water, until we're ready to jump in the river with the living God and go with the Spirit and what He's doing, we're going to miss out on enormous aspects of the kingdom and calling and His will and fruit in our lives. This has been a presentation of Valley Metro Church. To hear more messages or to support future podcasts, please visit valleymetrochurch.com.